Welcome back to Grave Stories Investigations. My name is Anonymous Host, and I'll be your host for this episode of another strange and truthful tale. When we hear of alien abduction stories, they are often accompanied by a phenomenon known as missing time. For abductees, what happened during these minutes, hours, or even days, and the lack of memory associated with it is just as terrifying as the abduction itself. Racing thoughts of the terrors that could have been inflicted on them while they were missing haunt their minds, and under hypnosis, many of these victims of capture by otherworldly beings are able to recall some, if not all, of the details of the events in which they sought answers. This is an occurrence that I am greatly intrigued by. There is a great episode of the original Unsolved Mysteries on the phenomena. A big reason I am interested is because I feel I experienced this. A few years ago, I was at an arcade in North Hollywood with my friend. We played video games for a few hours, then headed home. No alcohol or narcotics had been consumed. I myself had never drank in my life at that time. I remember getting to my car and sitting down in the driver's seat. I was also wearing a hat. It was a hat I wore all the time. A brown, houndstooth cadet cap with an upwards bent brim. After we got in the car, I have no memory of driving home. The next thing I remembered, I was sitting in my driveway, in the car, with no hat, and my friend was gone. I had apparently dropped him off. My friend recalled some of the drive and said he slept very heavily that night. I have no memory of making that 20 minute drive home and still cannot find my hat. I turned the car inside out. I believe we were abducted by aliens and my hat is somewhere on their spaceship. I'd really like that hat back. It was a really cool hat. I got it in Paris. Dang. Anyway, here are two such stories told over two episodes. That's right, we've got a two-parter because this one is a doozy. Technically, this is a three-parter if you include Tinfoil Tom's video on Travis Walton, which I advise you to check out after you watch part one of my series on UFO abduction stories. Tom does a lot of research on these episodes and helps me write these series and I'm sure he'd appreciate you subscribing to his channel and leaving a like. Maybe he can find my hat if you go comment on his videos. Now, without further ado, let's begin the greatest episode of Grave Stories Investigations ever. On the evening of October 1st, 1966, Robert Matthews, also known as Bob, got off a bus in North Truro, Massachusetts, a small village located close to the Cape Cod Resort area of Provincetown. Matthews, however, wasn't a visitor on vacation. He was due to report at the North Truro Air Force Station, a general surveillance radar facility operated by the U.S. Air Force. Robert was 19, and this was to be his first stationed assignment as a U.S. Airman. The bus driver had dropped him off in front of a local corner market, Dutra's Market, and instructed him to use the payphone out front to notify the radar station that he had arrived and needed a jeep to pick him up, as this was a practice at the time. Robert noticed the area was eerily quiet as the bus driver pulled away into the darkness of that cool October evening. Not a soul was in sight. Was it the time of the evening? Surely 8.45 wasn't that late. He must have thought to himself, maybe it was the fact that it was no longer tourist season. Just a month or two earlier, the folks would have been stopping in all night for snacks or a six-pack of RC Cola before heading off into the sandy dunes of Cape Cod or a late-night beachside bonfire. If you've ever been to one of these tourist destinations off-season, you'll understand the emptiness that occurs when the tourists leave. It's truly eerie. Whatever the case, Matthews made his way over to the payphone and called the base who told him someone would pick him up in just a few minutes. I should interject. I can't stop thinking about my hat. I got it in Paris. Did you know that? It was super cool. People called me a fashion man. Not anymore. Now they just look at my bald head. Sorry, this isn't why I interjected. The story hits close to home, literally. I'm from Cape Cod. I grew up in Mashby, and I've been to this exact payphone. I also worked on Otis Air Force Base, not too far away. I even witnessed a UFO in the same state of Massachusetts on Route 95. So when I heard this story, I couldn't help but investigate. Tinfoil Tom, who wrote this episode with me, is also from Cape Cod. He grew up in Provincetown, which is right next door to Truro, where Robert Matthews is currently standing. Speaking of, let's get back to Bob. While Bob was waiting in front of the market for his pickup, he noticed some strange lights in the sky, moving from right to left. He stared at them unsure of what he was seeing, then, suddenly, hit with an awful wave of what he described as fear. Matthews quickly reached again for the payphone, calling the base once more. Sure, it had only been a few minutes, but something just wasn't right, and he knew it. What were these bizarre lights in the night sky anyway? Robert had never seen anything like it before. The operator from the base informed him they had already sent a driver, 
no more than five minutes after he called the first time and he was nowhere to be found. The driver even got out and looked around for him. But the strangest part was that it was an hour ago. How could that be? In Robert's mind, it had only been mere moments, certainly no more than a few minutes. He made the first call, turned around, saw the strange lights, then went back to the payphone to make a second call. How could that have taken an hour? And how could the driver not have seen him? He was standing right there on the sidewalk. Did something happen to Bob when he looked up at those lights? If he wasn't there, like the driver said, then where was he for an hour? Once he got to the base, he was interrogated by military personnel and asked questions like, had he been drinking that night? To which he answered, no, of course not. He was just as baffled as they were. He was also asked about the lights he had seen in the sky and shown photographs of various aircraft, but it was like nothing he had ever seen before. Some years later, while on vacation, Bob was in a bookstore looking for something to read. He found himself mesmerized by the cover of a book while he was deciding what to buy. The book was titled Intruders and was written by Bud Hopkins, a terrifying tale of the UFO abduction of Kathy Davis in the early 1980s. On the cover, we see a gray type alien figure, you know, the classic alien, and that's what hit a nerve with Robert. Since childhood, he had recalled an incident in which an eerily similar figure had visited him one evening. As this creature entered his room, a slight green aura cast from its body. Robert shot up in bed and tried to scream for help, but nothing came out. Helpless to stop it, the visitor had done something to Robert's chest, but he could never be sure of what. For years, he had referred to this creature as a ghost, since he didn't know what to call it, whereas his mother had told him it was probably just a nightmare, maybe a night terror, some byproduct of an overactive imagination and late night creature feature. But seeing this book cover on the store shelf that evening in 1987, Robert Matthews knew this is what he had seen, and author Bud Hopkins was the man to call to get some answers. Now, here's where it gets even more interesting. Bud Hopkins, the author of the novel that stunned Matthews with his cover art, had a similar event witnessing a UFO in the sky near Truro just a few years prior to Matthews in 1964, along with two other eyewitnesses. He had this to say when interviewed by Nova about his encounter. I had a daytime UFO sighting on Cape Cod. It lasted about three minutes. The object seemed to be able to hover, and then it zoomed at great speeds straight into the wind. We had thought perhaps it was some kind of flat balloon or something, but clearly it wasn't. And when you see something like that and the three of us jumping out of the car finally to watch it disappear, you realize that there is some factor in the world that you had previously been unaware of, and it could be an extraordinary important factor. Okay, hang on. So this guy saw a UFO on Cape Cod, then experienced missing time, and I saw a UFO 20 miles from Cape Cod, then years later in LA experienced missing time. Interesting. But where's my hat? Maybe Bud Hopkins knows. Let's continue. Hopkins would later become known as the father of alien abduction stories after writing several books on the subject inspired by his initial encounter, one which would catch Robert Matthews' eye, as mentioned a moment ago. Bud was also a celebrated artist in addition to being a renowned UFO documentarian and researcher. He would spend much of his life until his death in 2011 interviewing abductees, often placing them under hypnosis, attempting to solve the question, what happened to these people and why couldn't they remember their missing time? In that same interview with Nova, Hopkins would say about the alien visitors abducting humans. They have their own reasons, and I'm not sure what those are. Sometime after discovering the work of Bud Hopkins, Robert Matthews contacted the author and agreed to meet with him and tell him his story. Additionally, Matthews agreed to be placed under hypnosis to attempt to dislodge the fragments of his memory that he had been unable to fully recover. Under hypnosis, Matthews describes witnessing an aircraft hovering above the parking lot of Dutra's Market after the bus had dropped him off. A ramp suddenly came down and light spilled out into the darkness of the Cape Cod night. Matthews, compelled to enter the ship, ascended the ramp and noticed four of the alien beings he had seen as a child to his left and two to his right. The interior of the ship, or at least the area he was allowed to see, was as he described it, clinical or like a doctor's office. As if not by his own will, he sat down on an examination table and looked down, only to realize his shirt and shoes had been removed. 
The aliens then examined his chest and had a sort of discussion amongst themselves. The next thing Robert Matthews remembered is making that second phone call. What were the visitors looking for on Robert exactly? Many of these abduction stories describe similar type of visitors bringing humans aboard spacecraft and performing experimentation for purposes of which we don't yet know or understand. But perhaps someday we will. Maybe I'll find my hat. Something I've heard of to dismiss cases like this is a phenomenon known as sleep paralysis. This is a very real medical condition where the body is in a state that is neither fully asleep nor awake. It's a kind of transition phase. If you experience an episode sometimes known as hypnagogic hallucination, you may have very vivid or disturbing visions that absolutely feel real, but simply aren't. Going back as far as 1664, when the Dutch physician Isbrand van Dimmerbroek first widely documented the phenomenon, although accounts from various cultures over time could describe incidents of sleep paralysis. Your body naturally represses movement during normal sleep, so you don't act out while dreaming, and the same applies to episodes of sleep paralysis. So that feeling that is so often reported of being awake and aware but not able to move anything or your eyes could be readily explained during an occurrence of sleep paralysis. Not only that, but since your mind is still dreaming but awake, you can manifest everything from demons or ghosts to even aliens or strange entities. It's very terrifying and certainly could apply to some cases of alien visitors, but could that be applied here? To this case, Bob had just gotten off the bus and was standing on a sidewalk. He was the farthest from being asleep as one can be. Something happened during that hour he was missing and I don't think it's possible he fell asleep from the time he phoned the base the first time to the second. Base personnel who were sent to pick him up not five minutes after his call searched for him and called him by name and there was no sign of Robert anywhere. Interesting to note is UFO researcher Bud Hopkins dismissed the idea of sleep paralysis as a cause for encounters flat out and said it was an inadequate explanation for those that experience abductions outside the bedroom, like in this scenario. For this case, I'll just have to mark it as unexplained for now. We need more information and more time. The more digging I do, the closer I'll come to the truth and finding my frigging hat those stupid aliens stole. It cost me 37 euros. <sighs> Another occurrence I'd like to discuss of missing time is probably one of the most famous cases. It's the story of Betty and Barney Hill. Some of you may have heard of this case from 1961. It took place a short drive north of Cape Cod in New Hampshire on an eerie fall night. So stay tuned for part two, which will be out soon. Until then, hunker down in the bunker with Tinfoil Tom and watch his alien abduction episode on Travis Walton, another very famous alien abduction story that I believe is truly credible and is my personal favorite episode of Tom's. It's about the abduction that inspired the movie Fire in the Sky. Also, if you have any alien abduction or sighting stories or anything spooky and unexplained at all, for that matter, you've experienced, please tell me. I read every single comment, but I'm sure you know that after seeing all the hearts I give. I'll feature and read my favorite comment in the next episode. And don't worry about the length. I like reading. Thank you for watching another installment of Grave Stories Investigations. Don't forget to check out the Grave Stories podcast, a much different, relaxed series where Nathan reads real-life ghost accounts and features nostalgic commercial breaks from the 80s. Find it on all major podcast platforms. Until next time, I'm Anonymous Host. Goodbye.